Councilman Lynch. Present. Councilor Backer. Here. Councilor Frick. Here. Councilor McGinty. Here. Councilor Mould. Present. Councilor Roberts. Here. Councilor Swift Kayata. Here. Student Representative Skylar Armstrong. Yes. Student Representative Brian Flynn. Yes. Manager McGovern. Yep. And the next item is the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, reports and correspondence. John? Uh, the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee had their final meeting last Thursday. Um, the final recommendation from the Budget Advisory Committee <coughs> excuse me, um, was a 2.67% increase in taxes um, for the Town of Cape Elizabeth. That amounts to an increase of about $22,000 up to $836,406. Uh, County commissioners will hold their meeting on the budget um, and approval of it next Monday, I believe that's the 15th, um, at the county courthouse. They, this is just a recommendation from the Budget Advisory Committee. The commissioners can raise it, lower it, keep it the same. Um, that's their option. So that was the final uh, recommendation from the Budget Advisory Committee. Councilor Roberts. I have a couple of issues or items relating to the November 4 election. And the first was the uh, town manager and myself were able to uh, attend the Cumberland County Commissioners meeting where they were almost immediately after the election looking to, for input to see if they should perhaps put the uh, item for the uh, co uh, Charter Commission back out on the, in the June election. And our town manager spoke quite eloquently to the, that they needed to get their facts together first and uh, let the issue uh, rest for a little while, as, w as did a number of other people at the meeting. It, well, it, it was well attended, and the, the common sentiment was that it was too soon to put that back out to uh, another referendum in six months' time. The other issue was on back on November 4, we had two new uh, school board members that were elected to fill a couple of vacant seats. And I'm disappointed that uh, they were not sworn in officially at the last council meeting. Uh, they were we were told, I understand, that uh, they wanted this to be at the school board meeting on that following Wednesday. The school board never officially welcomed them in, and we're having another meeting here tonight, and we're still not officially welcoming them. So Richard West and Kathy Wright, I would say, uh, please, I hope you have a good time serving, and I welcome you. <laughs> Well, I think we all welcome them. Yeah, I think we all do. And in fact, I had um, contacted the clerk's office to have them come to our last meeting to officially swear them in and understood that there were other plans. So um, it's not an oversight on the part of the council. And I, no, I, I trust really that, that they know that they are certainly um, most welcome in their new service to the town. Could I follow up on something sure. Jack said regarding the summit meeting that the county had? Um, they've appropriated approximately, I think about $80,000, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, um, to start a, for lack of a better term, PR campaign to get their issues and words out um, to the public better. Um, and so they're going to be working on some sort of communication strategy over the next year to uh, get their word out better. Could I just ask a question? Is that 80000 in this next year's in, budget? In the coming budget. In the coming year. Right. Okay. They start, they are, they're in a calendar year for their fiscal year. Okay. Um, I want to raise one item, too. I received a letter this weekend from the High School Parents Association. It was addressed to um, Dr. Frisella, but was copied to um, the town manager and myself, I guess, among others. And if I could... It, I did put a copy in front of all of your um, places, but I'd also like to uh, read at least parts of it. Dear Tom, the High School Parents Association met last night, and one of the major concerns of the evening was the unsafe traffic situation at the high school. The group all believed that the opening of the gate at Jordan Way in the morning from 7 until 7.30 had made a significant improvement. 
There was real concern now that the town had closed that option for the winter. Many parents and students were finally in the habit of using Jordan Way, thereby reducing the flow of traffic through the main entrance. And, and the letter goes on to ask um, that uh, Dr. Vercello work with uh, the town manager and um, the police chief to come up with a solution. And uh, I'd just like to say that I think that the traffic issue um, begs of both a permanent solution and an interim one. And it's not really our job to micromanage the in in intricacies of the traffic, but I'd like to send this letter off to the planning board and urge them as they're looking at $10 million worth of uh, renovations and enhancements to the school property that the planning board take a serious look at the all the associated traffic issues at both the high school and wherever they are so that um, we're not dealing with this in a, in a band-aid fashion. But also um, because the planning board process itself will take a while, um, it seems to me that um, you know we ought to be encouraging the uh, Mike, and I spoke with Mike today, to work with the chief to see if there isn't a way to um, keep the Jordan Way open at least on an interim basis. So um, that is in your package. And John? Um, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if maybe we should wait till we get the report from the traffic engineers that Mike can probably tell us when we expect to get that um, before we send that so that maybe we can have some input before we send it over there, or at least they will get the information um, and they wouldn't act prematurely on um, without having the complete report. That's just Mike, do you want to bring us up to date on the timing of that? Yeah, let's, uh, what John uh, is referring to is that there's a, a team of traffic engineers that have been looking at the high school intersection, the uh, Shore Road, Scott Dyer intersection, uh, Route 77 intersection, as well as the possibility of extending some of the town center sidewalks. Uh, that report is due by the end of the week here in the office. And John, I, I agree with you. The planning board ought to have the benefit of that report as well. But I thought they should see that the high school parents association is also very concerned with traffic. Sometimes people say that the traffic isn't a school issue, but um, you know it clearly is both a school and a town issue. No, I didn't have any problem with something. I just thought that they should get all this. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah, any other reports or correspondence? If I might follow up on John, we will make sure we have sufficient copies of that report to provide them with the planning board, uh, to the planning board as well as to the school board and the council. Right. Okay, Mike, it's time for your report, I guess. I have a, a very brief report. Just want to wish everyone the happiest of holidays and uh, continue to praise our public works department for enabling us all to be here this evening. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the minutes of our last meeting on November 10th. Do I have a motion? I move to accept it. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? One, two, four, five, six, seven, zero to accept. And it's uh, that time in our agenda for citizens um, who might like to discuss any items not on our agenda. <laughs> and Seeing none, I guess, um, we'll move to item 62. And item 62 is um, action to authorize the town manager to sign a purchase and sale agreement for the sale of 316 Ocean House Road, and that is for the sale of the lot right next to Town Hall. Is there a motion? Councilor Backer. Um, Chairman Lynch, I'd like to move that we table this item until the end of the meeting. We just move it to the end of the agenda and then consider it in executive session so we can discuss some of the terms rather than um, discuss the negotiation of the contract in public. And is there a second? Second. Okay. And uh, for the record, um, under the uh, Freedom of Information Law, we are entitled to go into executive session when we're discussing and negotiating contracts. So, is there any further discussion? All in favor? 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so we'll table that till later in the meeting and take it up in executive session. Uh, the next item is item 75, public hearing and action on the liquor license for the Inn by the Sea. And I will open this up to public hearing. Is anyone here from Inn by the Sea? I guess not. Seeing no one here to speak on this matter, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, Councilor Mould? Yes, I'd like to motion that we approve the annual liquor license for the Inn by the Sea. I'll second. Okay, for any discussion, Councilor Mould? I just would like to mention uh, for all those that are listening at home that if you're involved at all in any community activities around the town, the Inn by the Sea is a great community neighbor. They do a lot for every group in town. They're always there to donate something for whatever cause might need, might need funding, whether it's the Little League or the football team or other uses. And I just wanted, just wanted to mention that for everyone that's listening, that they, they have always been a very good uh, neighbor and resident here in Cape Elizabeth. Councilor swift Um I just wanted to check with the manager or assistant manager or whoever would know about this. Uh, last year, I believe, or two years ago, there had been some concerns by some of the neighbors about um, it, it, noise being a little bit too loud, music being a little bit too loud during some public functions there, and I was just wondering what was the recent record? I, I think Jackie uh -huh. checked with the law enforcement to see if there were any issues. Great. I know they had worked diligent. The, the inn had worked diligently to try to solve those problems, but I just and I hadn't heard any complaints lately. But I just wanted to check. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor of granting an annual liquor license um, for the coming year for the inn by the sea? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. In favor of the license. Just to clarify, that includes a number of licenses, uh, yes. including the the special use permit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Item 76 is a report from the Appointments Committee recommending changes to the policy for appointments to standing boards and commissions. Carol, are you going to? Sure. Um, the Appointments Committee in our um, deliberations about uh, appointments to boards and commissions on an annual basis, um, we looked at some of the policies that uh, we go by and um, developing and clarifying the lines of communication, particularly um, as in your packet on um, having an attendance record for boards and commissions, uh, making sure that meeting notices come through to the town hall so that we can have uh, proper notice to um, the public and that minutes are available to the public. Um, and we also clarify, are recommending a clarification that employees cannot serve on standing boards and commissions as, uh, as ex officio members. Um, so if there are any questions. And I assume we need to vote on these changes. Would you like to make a motion? Um, the Appointments Committee, uh, I'll move. The Appointments Committee recommends approval of the two policies that we've put before you, so I move that the Council uh, accept the amendments as proposed. Second. Any further discussion? Councilor Backer? Is, is it appropriate to point out typographical <laughs> items and grammatical items, or is that not something that should even be addressed with these? I, I would suggest that in, in all instances, you authorize the staff to uh, correct those, and if you, if you want to pen for your copy, we'd be happy to take them. And That's take fine. Time with me. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Councillor Swift-Piata? No, I was pointing. Oh, okay. Councilor I'm sorry, Councillor McGinty. Um, could Carol explain the rationale behind number 11 employees not being on board and It just seemed appropriate to us that employees might have um, in some cases might have kind of jurisdictions over over 
other employees if they're serving on a commission that's outside of their um, board or outside of their, their current position. I, I, can, so I could see them being denied if they had a conflict of interest of some sort, but if a, if a town employee is also a resident of the town has some special um, expertise or interest in a particular area, um, I wouldn't want to deny them as a resident not being able to sit on a particular board, notwithstanding any conflict of interest. And I, I was in that position. I was appointed to the cable TV commission when I worked for the police department. And I think that was the only one Mike we could find if it wasn't a conflict of interest. Um, but I wanted as a citizen of the town to, to serve on a board of commission. Um, you know, there was no conflict that we could find. And so I'm just concerned that they were eliminating perhaps some residents. I mean, they are taxpayers and they may want to be involved in areas outside of their employment. Yes, thank you. I think part of the, the rationale behind moving forward with this request is we have had some very good employees in the last number of few years that have wanted to be on boards or commissions that theoretically it, it could pose some difficulties for the town because, and it makes it very uncomfortable for the board to try to make that decision as to whether or not there's going to be a conflict there or if it's going to cause other issues with staff and we thought the cleanest way to do it would just be to say that town paid town employees will not be eligible for these boards other than ex officio uh, to not be putting ourselves in that position each year of having to tell somebody no and then trying to figure out why and how we're, how do we explain that to them or because we may feel there's a conflict they may not it's just it's so much easier just to have it in a language that there are enough other citizens in the town of Cape Elizabeth that can step forward to fill these boards and commissions that are, that are not already involved with the town. I hadn't even, I read through this whole thing and I hadn't even picked that up. I, I do think Councilor McGinty makes a reasonable argument that we would be denying we could potentially deny, deny someone the opportunity to serve on a board, even if they had no conflict. And I know determining conflicts can be tricky, and I've served on the appointments committee, and I know it, it can be difficult sometimes. But I, I, think, I think it would be better to have to have the appointments committee deal with the, and, and the board or commission that uh, this person might be on deal with that conflict issue and, and give them that as the reason for not being able to serve, as opposed to just having a blanket um, prohibition. Um, I understand it's very difficult, but I was wondering, does the manager have an opinion on this? Yes, I do. And what is that opinion, Mr. Manager? Because uh, I'm, conflict I'm conflicted on this, so I would like to hear a little yeah, more. Through, through, the, through the chairman, with her permission. Uh, is as uh, Councilor Fritz explained, we've had a number of issues over the last few years where this has come up. Uh, for example, in, in where it's with, you know, if someone applies for the planning board, uh, you know, they're dealing with issues that the department head is also dealing with. And it's a little bit awkward. Do you listen to the department head or do you, li or do you listen to the other person? While they may do it as a private citizen, while they're doing it as, as for example, both as a police officer and as a member of the community and as a planning board member, it becomes really awkward in terms of, you know, what role, what hat do they really have on. And instead of showing the deference to the decision that's been made collectively by a department to, mm -hmm. that comes through the department head, it begins to be looking at, at one individual person. Another issue that came up was someone applied to be uh, a library trustee. And, you know, while that would seem rather harmless, and even though the library trustees don't formally evaluate the librarian, they are clearly, you know, if there was an issue there, that would be a forum for it to come up through. And just, you know, for the good of the, uh, you know, good fellowship within the organization, uh, it's best to avoid situations where you have departments, potentially, or members of individual departments in an official capacity mm -hmm. being critical of, of another department. Those are the, those are the primary reasons. 
But would not those sorts, and I agree, those would be situations we would definitely not want to get into, but would, would not those sorts of situations be dealt with on a conflict basis? Uh, and I mean not once they're on the board, but I mean in terms of if someone applies, ruling, basically the, the appointment committee ruling them out as an appropriate. Was that a rhetorical or was that a? No, that that's, was a, that's a real okay. question. I, I'm, trying, yes, may. I'm trying to learn here. As we looked at the different boards and commissions, we came up with virtually every single board and commission the situation occurred. The Arts Commission is a board that uh, oversees, you know, is again staffed by the librarian and there could be issues. The Port Williams Advisory Commission, uh, you know, interacts with all sorts of different departments on different issues. And again, that board can sometimes be critical of public works that, that you know, they're not doing this thing the way they'd like it to have done. Uh, so and as we looked at every board and commission, there was, there was always that potential that we would hope to avoid. So it's your opinion that because Cape Elizabeth is basically such a small town that it's an in inherent difficulty because the, the town staff is so small that there are overlaps amongst the departments there are there are many overlaps so many amongst the department that it and, make it difficult. and I think the other area is, is, is as far as you know the appearance to the public that it is an open process that it is an inclusive process that there not be the feeling that employees are going to be appointed mm -hmm. uh, over you know some other citizen that you know the, the more citizens involved the better yeah. thank you good then I I'm convinced by uh, the arguments of the appointments committee and the manager so I will defer to their recommendation but thank you for clarifying that matter. I'm, I'm wondering if you want to put the, the town um, attorney on the spot, um, whether this would be defensible by excluding an entire group of people um, out of hand. I, you know, I don't think it's fair to ask the town attorney a question that, you know, we haven't brought him here for. He hasn't looked, he probably hasn't even looked at the policy that's before us tonight. So. I, I think I it's an unfair position to put him in. So. Councilor Backer? I have one other item. Um, the policy we have that policy number four in the appointments, the statement of policy regarding the appointments of standing boards and commissions says that a citizen may serve up to two full consecutive terms as a regular member. Um, except members of the Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals and the Conservation Commission may serve up to three consecutive terms. Um, I note, just jumping ahead to the next item on our agenda, that we are going to be asked to approve the appointment of an individual to an additional term, despite the fact that the individual has already completed two consecutive terms. And it seems to me that approval of that item based on our current policy would be prohibited. And I wonder if we should consider changing our policy um, as stated to permit for good cause shown the council to appoint a person for one additional one year term um, when we find a compelling reason to do so. Um, otherwise, I think if we approve this as written, we're going to be forced to deny the next item that comes up on our agenda, which the council may be inclined to do. But I'd be inclined not to deny the next item. And in order to do that, what I'd like to propose by motion is that we amend paragraph four of the statement of policy to simply add a sentence at the end of that that says, provided, however, for good cause shown, the town council may appoint a person for an additional one-year term. So it wouldn't be a full two-year appointment, but just one additional one-year term. That's a That's, I'll second if there was a motion. Thank you. Okay. A motion to amend. And did we have the original motion? We have the original motion. Would you accept that as a friendly amendment? The original motion. Um, actually, I <clears throat> I would just as soon debate that amendment um, and vote on that separately. Um, okay, well, 
debate now, right? Debate that now, then. We have an amendment and a second to the amendment. And is there discussion? Well, um, I think that the, the appointment to more than a second term in the case of the, um, let me see, <clears throat> the Board of Assessment Review, I think you were referring to. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That really is an unusual case because we are in the, that person came up for the third term kind of in the middle of um, having the revaluation considered. And it seemed to us in that case that because we were in the middle of that process and having somebody that was experienced, um, that made sense to continue. Um, but I think the general idea of having only two terms, except in the case of like the planning board and zoning board, I think there are real reasons for those two going beyond in that it, it's a real learning curve on the zoning board and planning board to learn all the ordinances and that sort of thing. And in the, in view of really trying to have turnover and new ideas and, um, you know, new approaches to things, we should have two, two consecutive terms. This seems to me that it's really leaving it open for many more cases of more than two terms. And, and I don't think that's the, the way it ought to be. I would argue that you just made the case for what David is asking, and that is in extraordinary circumstances, right. in this case with the assessments, mm -hmm. that we would be allowed to mm -hmm. appoint somebody for an additional term. Perhaps we could limit it to an additional time period as opposed to additional term, right. as, mm -hmm. and I don't know if Councilor Backer would be interested in change motion or rewording that to say, an additional period of time or additional term or period of time less than a term or something of that nature I don't, and that may make it too complicated but um. Councillor Swift Piata and then Councillor Backer I like Councillor Backer's um, suggestion but I believe he said one additional year not an additional term in his amendment to motion that's what I had provided however that for good cause shown, a member may be appointed for an additional year. A year? Okay. It, I, I have said an additional one-year term. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's more appropriate to say okay, an additional one-year term. I wrote down one-year term. If it's period. a year, that's fine. Councilor Backer. And I agree with all of Councilor Fritz's statement, but I underscore the fact that if it is important to appoint someone under extraordinary circumstances like apparently is the case with the Board of Assessment Review, we can't adopt the policy as is and then approve the appointment because the appointment will then be contrary to our established policy and the Board of Assessment Review is one that involves decisions that are directly appealable to the court. And if we have an appointed member that is appointed contrary to our established policies, it may very well be that any decision by that board uh, would not withstand judicial scrutiny. And we have to have somebody who's properly appointed if we're going to expect their decisions to be reviewed by a court and upheld. Jack? Just a point of clarification from Councillor Backer. The language states that a person can serve two full terms or three full terms, depending upon the Board of Commission. We have the situations now where fill somebody is filling an unexpired term. Do we need any language of that to show that they could actually, they're doing potentially more than two full terms and we consider it legal. Let's say they came in on and filled two years of one term, then they could be reappointed for two more full terms. Is this language contrary to that in your opinion? I'm going to ask the town manager to... Yeah, you know, my, it's already understood that this is full terms and it does not mm -hmm. include the completion of unexpired terms that's been the past practice. That would not be a problem. And I think the, the amendment that is as well is conceived. Could, um, Councillor. In, in, in hearing Councillor Backer's discussion of this and, and understanding that he's saying a year, not a full 
additional time, um, I'm willing to have that as a friendly amendment. amendment. Okay. Is there any further discussion of the motion and friendly amendment? Can we move to the amendment? Move to the amendment. Well, Councillor Fritz has said that she would accept it as a friendly oh. amendment, oh. so I don't yeah. think we need to vote on it. We'll vote on the motion as amended by Councillor Backer. And all in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, seven in favor. And the next item is item 77 which is the report from the appointments committee recommending citizens to serve on boards and commission councillor fritz okay um the appointments committee well i'll i'll move um the list of uh recommended annual board and commission appointments and the appointment of the fair hearing officer uh, as we recommended in the list and if i might um, might read the list of appointments to the boards and commissions and all of the terms except the ones that I indicate are for three-year terms starting in January running through December of 2006. Um, so for the Board of Assessment Review, David Griffin, and that appointment is until December 31st, 2004, so one year. Um, for the Arts Commission, uh, Anne Dietrich, and that appointment is a one-year term, 2004. Christine Morgan, a full term. Marley Hill, a full term. Um, for um, the Community Services Advisory Commission, which are really school board appointments, is Sharon Roberts and Judy Rowe. For the Conservation Commission, Carol Haas and David Sterling. The Fair Hearing Officers for a three-year term of Henry and Barry III. The Fort Williams Advisory Committee, Chet Ross and Steve uh, Parker. For Personnel Appeals Board, Peter Howe. For the Planning Board, Andy Charles, David Griffin, and David Sherman. For the Recycling Committee, we do still have a vacancy. Um, Louise Sullivan and Jeff Van Fleet. For the Thomas Memorial Library, Patricia Breedenberg and Robert Steyer. And for the Zoning Board of Appeals, Mike Trafago. Okay, thank you, Carol. So this <coughs> A report, <coughs> and do you want to move? I, um, I have moved to um, for the town council to approve the appointment okay. as recommended. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? I, Council Roberts. I would just like to thank all of the people that uh, came forward and expressed an interest in serving the town on these boards and commissions for doing so, and uh, again wishing them well for their for their terms. And, and I think also make sure um, that I think you included in that all the people all, who all came the forward people, yes. who might not have been selected this time around, but we appreciate their interest in um, volunteering to serve the town, and we encourage them to come forward again. So with that, all in favor? 7-0 uh, to approve and, the appointment. Um, Madam Chairman, I'd, I'd just really like to thank Deborah Lane, um, the Assistant Town Manager, for all the help that she's given the Appointments Committee. Thank you, Deborah. And the next item is item 78, which is a report from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission recommending amendments to the policy governing group uses at Fort Williams. There is a report in your package, and I do see Alan Barthelman, who's the chair of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission one of our citizen commissions here. So I don't know, Alan, were you planning to address? Okay. Do you want to come up 
to the podium. Are there any questions for Alan? Councilor McGinty. I, I was a little confused by the definition of a vehicle intensive event. Um, on the first page, it mentions car shows, and then on page um, three, it has the fee going from four to eight dollars per vehicle. <clears throat> is it the, car sh the cars in the car show that is vehicle intensive, or is the people who attend an event that would be parking? And that it's, it's, it's basically the cars in a car show. Vehicle intensive means car show. So if a car show with 30 cars, they pay 30 times. That's right. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't mean if there's a fireworks show where we know we're going to get a whole bunch of cars. No. Okay. All right. Just let go. Are there other questions for Alan? Alan, I'd like to thank you and on behalf of the council, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, for all the work that you put in, not just on this report, but all the work you do all year. And looks like a good report. Thank you. Is there a motion? Or Councillor McGinty? Uh, I move approval of the uh, group and commercial uses of Fort Williams Park as proposed. And this is Second. Councillor Bassett. Any further discussion? Councillor Sosetta. This is just a comment. On the fourth um, page, there was an item at the top of the page that I was um, unclear about. <laughs> But that clarification from the manager, and I just wanted to mention, um, it's in the second paragraph, it says, except for funds received to reimburse town expenses, all revenue generated from this policy shall accrue to the Fort Williams Park Capital Fund at the direction of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Um, it had said the operating budget, the Fort Williams Park operating budget and or the capital fund. So I questioned the manager, and he clarified for me that that giving them, putting the money into the capital fund has been the practice for, for quite a while. So this is not a significant change in practice. And it is the Fort William Park Capital Fund. It is not the advisor, uh, the, the lighthouse. charitable trust or the lighthouse or anything else. I just wanted to clarify that for anyone who might be watching. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Seven in favor of the new policy or the amendment to the existing policy. The next item is a report from the fire chief, item 79, regarding regionalization initiatives with the city of South Portland. And I see him back here. Welcome. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Go from one week to the other. Um, I, I, this regionalization, I think, isn't anything new to fire service. It's something that's been ongoing. Um, I would say especially so in the area that we're going to be implementing this even more so. Um, Engine 1, Cape Cottage Station, has been working with Willard for many, many years. When I was in South Portland, we were working with each other. So this isn't anything new. However, I think timing is critical, and I think um, right now it is a good time. I think both companies are very open to it. Uh, the managers have been involved with it and um, been very cautious that it's been driven from the company level up, not from the administration down. And for that reason, I think the companies are very comfortable with it, uh, both the Willard um, company and our um, engine one uh, company. You have a, a, a report there. Uh, I think probably the highlight at this point, because this is kind of uh, a three-stage situation, and we're going to try we're going to trial this with the first stage. And the first stage is that um, our engine company will be responding into South Portland in the Willard area in what I call the South Portland Heights area, which is the area over around Clifford, Sawyer, and Delbert, Hamlin School, if you will. And I didn't list it here, but Cooperville, we call it, which is down uh, off from Scammon Street and throughout that neighborhood, Anthony, Highland Avenue. 
in South Portland, um, their permanent engine company handles uh, still a lot of uh, smaller calls. And so the, the only time that the Willard company responds into those areas is when there's a more serious call, uh, what we re refer to as a box alarm. The same way out here, um, when we have a still alarm in town, hmm. we respond both companies because we want to make sure that we have adequate manpower to do what it is that we need to do. When we have a box alarm, then we pick up additional engine company and a ladder company. So Willard will be responding when we have a box alarm in the Shore Road area, all the way out to where the water makes up at, at the, what I call Smuggler's Cove, what you call Smuggler's Cove, and all the side streets off of Shore Road, um, all of Mitchell Road, and all of the side streets off of Mitchell so Portland will be responding with their engine too. And in some uh, <coughs> cases, with their lab, um, in areas that we have multiple three-story buildings, if you will, um, we can in help our rating by having them respond with a ladder versus an engine company because we already have um, at least two engine companies responding. And they're very agreeable to do that. So we're working out specifically which boxes each company will be responding to. It'll be the responsibility of the department that's dispatching the call to notify the, uh, the uh, adjoining department that the call is in. Most of the time, our dispatchers pick up the calls that South Fulton is putting out and vice versa. But we talked about that tonight and it'll be the responsibility of the department that's dispatching the call to make sure that the other company is notified. We figured this out and it, was, and it came out to be, and, and there's no way of knowing this, we took past records. But as you'll see um, in past records, uh, we figured that it would be uh, approximately 40 to 50 calls uh, a year that our Willard station would be responding. And that would be a cost of somewhere around $3,000. That's 50 calls with an average of six firefighters at $10 an hour. Most of your calls are, are an hour. You do get the times when you get extended extended operations, but generally on those, we're in a multiple alarm type situation, and those departments are responding, and we're responding to them as well. Conversely, um, we will be responding into South Portland's calls, and as you see here, we figured it was about 40 calls a year at a cost of around $2,800. And again, there's no way of knowing. Um, something can throw this all off. But this history is showing that this is, it runs pretty true as to what I'm telling you. Dr. Roberts? Chief, uh, Chief, can you explain a box a lot? Is that the one you pull like on a okay. telephone pole, or does that count a, a, a cell phone call as well? Yeah. That's, that's good. Uh, what we call uh, a box alarm is, is a more serious call, if you will. Uh, if somebody pulled the fire alarm box up there on the wall, it would transmit through to our dispatcher, and the only thing the dispatcher knows is he's getting a box from town hall. He doesn't know the seriousness of the call, so he would dispatch multiple companies in that particular scenario. If um, we had a call of a chimney fire, which always has the possibility of extension into the home, uh, we would put on what we call a box alarm. So any of the more serious calls, uh, a car fire um, in the street would be a still alarm, but a car fire in a garage would be a box <laughs> alarm. So it would be, the, again, the more serious of the calls. And it's the dispatchers, on the information that they get, they have protocol on what they're dispatching, but it also leaves some amount of judgment up for them. The still alarms, the CO calls, uh, wires arcing in a tree, uh, grass fires, minor type calls are generally still alarms. And again, in South Portland and still alarms, the call companies don't even go out and they're handled by on-duty full-time people. But out here, we respond. But on our still alarms, we would send just engine two and engine four companies uh, on the call, not South Portland. Thank you. 
you very much. Um, um, it doesn't say in here, but I'm assuming that the cost to be borne by the municipalities themselves. I mean, we're not, we're not going to pay for South Portland. They're going to pay for their people. We're going to pay for it. That's correct. We will pay for our own. Yes. Yeah, or, uh, regardless of the cost. Yes. Yeah. On that point, if I for you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, my, my sense is this was adopted by the council this evening that we will want to formalize with South Portland all of these arrangements to an interlocal agreement uh, so that those issues are spelled out immediately because that's the standard interlocal agreement. We also, if, you know, if the council approves this this evening, prior to it actually beginning, we will be reconfirming with uh, the municipal association as a result of the vote tonight that we, we have all the insurance coverages uh, that we need to have in place, which is the other uh, piece that we need to be sure Okay, sir. Just a question. You had mentioned that we we have we can have a better rating by having this arrangement because we're covering it better. <laughs> Does that translate into any dollar? Okay. I, I, that, if I what what I mean is that anything that we do in this line can help us. I'm not sure that it's going to change our rating. Okay, but it's certainly not going to hurt us. For, for an example, um, you're supposed to have a ladder company within two and a half miles streetwise of any three-story building. Right now, in place, it's been in place for a number of years, uh, the, uh, um, the church down on Shore Road, uh, the Woodland Apartments, um, the apartment houses at 596 and uh, Trouble Street, get a response of a South Portland ladder, the basics had that fire, that multiple alarm fire a few years ago. It's an automatic, they come. So anytime that you can do something like that when the insurance service office comes in and grades, they're looking at, are you, are you doing these kind of things? And especially if there's a formal agreement to it, um, it lends that much more credence to your rating. We have an excellent rating at, at the present time, and it would take something very dramatic to occur to I think increase our rating. We're you know we're a class three, almost a class two. It's, it's a great rating for <coughs> excuse me, our department. That Dr. doesn't particularly Robert. help the town, right? It helps the individual insurance policyholder on the rate that they have. Your insurance rating has an impact on what you pay, what you pay for premiums <laughs> on your fire insurance. Yes. So the town is not directly seeing cash. But, our but the homeowners that live here are getting that benefit in their policy. Is there further discussion? No further questions for the chief? I, just, I have one comment. Please, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to thank particularly the two companies, the Willard Company and our own uh, Engine One Company. As the chief mentioned, we've approached this whole thing with the companies in the driver's seat. I think the first two or three meetings they had without the benefit of uh, any senior officers present, the, the managers, I think Jeff might have attended one meeting, Jeff Jordan, but I haven't attended actually any of them. I've kept up with some of the discussions. And, and this evening as we speak, uh, the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department, the Cape Cottage folks are hosting the Willard folks over at the town center fire station for a ham dinner uh, <laughs> and also meeting. So uh, that's just an indication of uh, how cooperatively uh, they are working, that they are uh, socializing together as well as meeting together. And I thank you as well. Uh, regionalization has become the new buzzword, if you will, but it's um, great to hear of the cooperation that has existed already, and this will only enhance the service, we hope. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we need a motion to... Um, Authorize. Hmm. What? You have something written out, David? Because I do, if you don't. Um, no, I'm willing to make a motion. You're ready to make a motion? Go. I'm ready. <laughs> um, I move uh, that we um, adopt the regionalization proposal as presented by uh, Chief McGoldrick and that we authorize. Um, the Cape Elizabeth Fire Chief to proceed with implementing the regionalization plan with South Portland subject to the town manager negotiating an interlocal agreement with the city of South Portland. Second. Okay, any 
Discussion of the motion. All in favor? Seven zero. David, thank you. David, I think we were separated at birth. <laughs> I had written <laughs> almost virtually an identical motion. I, I could read your notes from here. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can read my <laughs> notes, David. <laughs> okay, and the next item on the agenda is get my glasses on. It's item 80, a report from the town clerk recommending the purchase of a second AccuVote optical scanner. And this is about as responsive as government gets, I think. <laughs> so, well, Jackie? Um, the uh, election last month showed a definite need for a second ballot in an optical scanner. The cost of the scanner and the related equipment is $6,500. I discussed this with the town manager and he has identified the town hall computer upgrade account as a possible source of funding. The computer upgrade account is used to replace personal computers, monitors, laptops, sensors, and digital cameras, and for the upgrade itself here in all departments. Um, 12,500 was budgeted for this physical year and to date there have been no expenses from the account. I would like to recommend the town council approve the purchase of a second active vote optical scanner with the cost to be allocated from the town hall computer upgrade account. Thank you. Councilor Moore. I would like to move that we purchase a second active vote optical scanner. Second. Councilor McGinty. Um, I assume we appropriated the twelve thousand dollars, twelve thousand five hundred dollars for some purpose. Um, will this have an impact on other? computer updates in the town it it may it's uh you know, it, that's an account that we you know, as, as jackie explained that we appropriate each year and it used to be that we used to identify this computer will be replaced and that computer will be replaced the way the computers are instead we've gone on a system we replace things when they break down and the, the good news is, is that through the first six months of the year we did not have the breakdowns uh, uh with computer we did purchased some equipment last June, some of some, some new screens, that type of thing, but we've, we've had good experience. I can't promise that we're not going to have uh, breakdowns in the next six months, but I, I can see, I do know that we had a, a, uh, a long line. <laughs> and, you know, I would, I would prefer to take the risk uh, of further breakdowns, because, you know, if that happens, I think everyone will understand that we'll, we'll need it, but I don't think folks will understand that we have long lines again why we didn't address that problem. Thank you. And Jackie, I have a question. When would the scanner be in place? We could use it in the mail option. Okay, so you'll be able to order it and yep. get it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Councilor Roberts. Notwithstanding the fact that we need a second scanner just for the number of people that came out to vote, I think it's an excellent idea to have a backup one as well. I was concerned last year that uh, we only had one, and I thought to myself, what happens if that one breaks down? So this answers that same question as uh, that, that insurance policy, where we will get immediate returns by having the second one. Okay, Councilor Fritz. I, I think this was an unusual election with three ballots, so every single person that was there was put in, had to put in three ballots, and, and I don't think that happens that often, um, but the backup does seem to be a good idea. So I, I will support this. Any further discussion? If ever there was a evidence of a need, I think the November election showed it. So all in favor of the purchase of an additional voting machine? Seven zero. Thank you very much. And the next item is a report from the assistant town manager, Deborah Lane, recommending the acceptance of gifts received since Jan since the De December O two council meeting. And there is in our package a list um, and a report from Deborah Lane. Are there any questions of Deborah? Is there a motion? Councilor McGinty. 
Um, I move that we accept a list of gifts and donations as presented. Second. Any further discussion? I just want to, um, it's a long list of gifts um, from a number of people, and I just want to say thank you to all of those um, people and organizations and companies that, that made gifts to the town. Um, it, it just truly appreciated. So thank you. And um, we'll have a vote. All in favor of accepting the gifts? Seven zero. The next item is a letter from the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust to assist with the preservation of the Jordan Farm land on Wells Road. And find that. This um, letter, I will um, read this letter out loud because I think it's good for the public to um, be aware of these things. Council members, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust has been working for several years to enable Bill Jordan and his family to continue farming on their Wells Road land without selling their land for development. This parcel overlooking the Spurwink Marsh has consistently topped the list for most scenic areas valued by Cape Elizabeth citizens in the assessment of the visual resources of Cape Elizabeth's 1989 report and the Comprehensive Plan 1993. We believe it is in the best interest of the town to preserve this land, and we appeal to the council to endorse this effort. Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is very proud to have, have successfully obtained grants from the Land for Maine's Future Board and the Federal Farm and Ranch Land Program in the amount of $1,079,450 towards the purchase of development rights to 45 acres of the Jordan Farm, rec recognized by most as the pick your own strawberry field. To complete the purchase of the development rights, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust needs to raise only $220,550 of a $1.3 million purchase. Having received financial support from the town for previous land acquisitions, the Land Trust respectfully request that the town contribute 100000 to help preserve these scenic fields. The importance of farmland preservation cannot be overstated. The protection of this open space adds to the local economy by providing produce for sale and local employment. Cape's legacy of farming and fishing is in danger of fading away, the loss of which would literally change the face of the town trying to preserve its rural character. Um, and the letter goes on from there. Um, I have been asked to mention by the Land Trust that they were unable to be here tonight. Tonight is their um, board meeting, and uh, they had a number of uh, things that they had to take care of. So um, they are um, anxious, though, to come before the council, e either at a meeting or a workshop at another point in time. And I wonder if I might have a Councilor Roberts. I would move to refer this request to the Finance Committee to determine the town's ability to assist. I'll second that. Okay, is there any discussion? Councilor McGinty? Are they under any time frame? Um, there's nothing. Further discussion? Are all in favor of referring this request to the Finance Committee of the Town Council? Thank you, people. Five, six, seven, zero. In favor of reference to the Finance Committee. And the next item is item 83, a request from the town manager to have the planning board review issues related to the adequacy of the current tower overlay zone in meeting cellular phone coverage requirements and public safety communication <coughs> needs. There is a memo from the town manager in our package um, U.S. Cellular is proposing to place two new cellular towers in the community. One would be at, on Sprague Corporation land adjacent to Sprague Hall, and the other would be at the rear of the former fire station at Fort Williams. 
and the town manager has requested that we refer this to the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board and the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> Councilor Fritz. Um, I think it, it, I don't know, I think John and I are probably the only counselors that were on uh, when we had quite an extensive study of towers and developing places where you were, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Councilor Fitzgerald was also. And oh. Councilor Roberts. Oh. All right. I'm, a majority of I guess it seems like it. It wasn't that long ago. Time flies. It only feels that way. Um, but, y you know, you'll remember the controversy of uh, trying to place towers, and and I think that I think we ended up deciding at that time that relay situations from the current towers um, could work, and at least the assumption was that that, that was the way we were going to go to provide for definitely pockets where, where cell phones don't work and where our emergency um, cell phones don't work as well in the Fort Williams and the Two Lights area. Um, I think that putting a tower in Fort Williams is going to be fairly controversial. Um, I still think we ought to be looking into uh, these relay systems rather than putting up big cellular towers if that is, is the intention. Um, so I'd just like to caution the planning board. They may have new members and the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. They didn't even talk about cell phones before and towers. Um, but they go back and look at those the extensive study that was done and, um, and certainly consider other alternatives to placing towers um, as the whole. <laughs> okay. Um, I just have a question. Um, in this memo from uh, the manager, he talks about, uh, with regard to Fort Williams, he talks about uh, eliminating the tower currently at the park above the former civil defense bunker. And I was unclear as to where that was. I think I know where the former um, fire station is, but could you just clarify where those two places are? This just happened to be. Just happened to be. <laughs> it, no, seriously, it's just, it is a coincidence. I was usually with Cub Scouts. So this is the entrance road to Fort Williams to come in. There's a little circular driveway just after you get beyond the beach. There's, there's an old, uh, there's the old civil defense bunker. There's an antenna that sticks up in the air right there. It's been there for 50 years or more. Uh, the, the old fire station is up. In the, uh, most of it, most everyone would think of it in the area where when you go to Family Fun Day or the fireworks, it's up on that hill way up in, in the back there. As you're entering the fort, uh, you have that remains of a stone building mm -hmm. uh, about halfway in the entrance. If you go up over that hill, the fire station is just above that, and the area that has been suggested is the fire station. I should point out that uh, if you look at the way the agenda is worded, uh, it, it's neutral as to the specific uh, suggestion from the representative of the U.S. Cellular, it's that the, the issues be looked at. I, I, when I did that, I, I did it as a cautionary reason because but we hadn't heard from the Sprague yet whether or, not that they, whether or not they had interest because the land in back of Sprague Hall is in fact their property. Uh, I haven't heard it confirmed by the Sprague then, then though that they are interested in. But interestingly, Ed Shaw, the representative of uh, U.S. Cellular, called today and indicated that while he wanted to do the Fort Williams one, Bill wanted to do it, he was just a little bit ahead of himself. And that that approval might not come to like a, a second phase. So again, you know, as far as them wanting to fund it and wanting to do it. So again, I think it, it's important that we focus on the wording that's on the agenda is asking the planning board generally to look at this issue in terms of the citizens use of cell phones and in terms of our public safety needs without, without necessarily direct reference to the proposal from the U.S. Cellular, because I think as Councilor Fritz points out, uh, you know, it is important to look 
at all ways uh, of dealing with issue. But most importantly, there, there are an awful lot of folks who complain quite a bit about the sporadic cellular phone service in Cape Elizabeth. And the really nice thing mm -hmm. about the, uh, the one proposed to Sprague Hall is it is in an area that isn't impactful of too many residents, but it, it sends the signal down to uh, all of Broad Cove, which is what that study is showing. And no other study that we saw, the one that Mrs. Chris mentioned, or uh, any other one, has been able to get into Broad Cove and uh, provide the service that Victor did. Same thing holds for two lights and some other areas, but I, I mentioned Broad Cove because it is a, uh, a well populated area that a lot of folks uh, seek to use their, their cell phone. Mr. Mold. I did want to mention that, as uh, Mike said, we get a lot of complaints of cell phones not working. It is also a safety issue, so I also want to send a message to the planning board that I fully support the addition of these cell towers wherever they find them appropriately to be placed. Well, I'll be voting in favor of the motion, but I, I want to be clear to the planning board that I'm not sending a message either way. I would like them to just look at the issue of public safety and cell phone service and make some recommendations. And I think it's uh, great, particularly with respect to Fort Williams, that we don't have a specific application in front of us. And so we have the luxury to look at it in a thoughtful fashion. I just don't want my vote in support of the motion to be interpreted as in support of any particular action by the planning board. Councillor Swift, Arata. And I would agree with the, with the chairman in, in that. I just would like to get more information from these two bodies as to how they think those two issues of public safety and improved cell service could be addressed. I have no opinion pro or con at this point as to the merits of either specific proposal, which I understand now aren't so specific as I thought. Councillor McGinty. Ditto and ditto with uh, the chairman and uh, Anne Swift to have. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion? Two, four, five, six, seven, zero, to send this to the planning board. Okay. And, and the Fort Williams. And the Fort Williams, I'm sorry, and the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, most assuredly. And we are at that point in our agenda for citizens' items again, uh, items not on the agenda. Do we have our high school representatives who'd like to address us? Great. You can state your name and um, go forward from there. Oh, my name is Skylar Armstrong, and I'm the high school student representative. And this is just in reference to the um, letter you got from the parents association earlier you talked about. And as a driver who drives the high school, um, there is definitely an immediate need for a solution to the traffic problem. I come from the side of the town that has to make a left-hand turn in the morning to get into school. And I know from my side of the town, there's often line five or six minutes just to turn from Old Ocean House Road to the entrance of the school, which is like 500 yards maybe. And it's very hard to wait five minutes there. It's also, especially with the snow and ice coming, it's a lot more dangerous, I feel, and there's a lot more chances of accidents occurring. So I really hope that the town council can help the community as a whole solve this problem. Thank you, Skylar. It's great to hear firsthand experience of our young youngest drivers. Okay, um, with that, um, I guess we need a motion to go into executive session. We will um, come out of executive session. I'm sorry, Councilor McGinty. I think we need to take this off the table first. We'll put it on the table. Okay, thank you. I'm well advised. So a motion to take it off the table. So moved. Second. Any discussion? No, all in favor? And now a motion to go into executive session. We, let me explain to the public who may be watching. We will go into executive session um, for however long that takes, we will come out of executive session and we will vote or not vote as the case may be in public. Um, the televised portion of the meeting is 
over, um, but the results would be available on the website um, probably as soon as tomorrow. So um, with that, we'll move to go into executive session. For the purpose of? For the purpose of uh, discussing the purchase and sale agreement for 316 Ocean House Road. Discussions with the town attorney. So all in favor? Oh, I thought we had a motion. I'm sorry. Oh, so a motion. So moved. Yeah. We have second. a second. A second. All in favor? Seven zero. Go into executive session. Thank you. Um, Madam.